Okay, everyone, welcome. Uh, welcome to NET Seminar for this year. I think this is the 15th year we are having a NET Seminar. Um, Okay, thanks, Anissa. I'm Guru Parulkar. I, I serve as the executive director of this ONRC. And again, welcome to the first next seminar of the academic year. And it's my pleasure and honor that we have JR uh, giving us the first uh, talk of the year. Um, JR, uh, so JR is one of the few people that uh, I got to know about his reputation first. And then after several years, I got to meet him. Uh, he has had a reputation to design the, the best uh, switching systems uh, for many, many years. Uh, that is how I got to hear about his name, then got to finally meet him. And he has been in the networking space for uh, many years from the very beginning and has built some of the most popular switching systems, uh, switches that we use uh, in the network or in the internet. And now he's up to something even more exciting. <laughs> and he's going to tell us about it. So welcome. A little bit. Yeah, thanks, Guru. Um, Actually, what I came to talk about today is a little bit less about what we're doing at Cumulus and a little bit more about what's going on in the industry around networking. Um, and I'm sure you guys don't really want to hear product pitches, but you're more interested in things that you might either be able to leverage or, uh, or be exposed to. Um, you know, clearly, most of you know that Stanford's involved in a lot of research around what I call high-fidelity networking. Um, and there's, you know, there are use cases around high-fidelity networking but in, in addition, there's a lot of use cases around what we call bulk networking, you know, where you set up a high capacity IP fabric, you want it to be easy to deploy, easy to manage, easy to use. Um, I've been involved in a lot of those, you know, a lot of the MS, we call the massively scale data centers, deploy this type of a fabric, as opposed to something super high fidelity, it's just kind of a chaotic environment, they set up a big high capacity network and they just want to let it roll, get out of the way. So, what I want to do today is talk about some of the things that we've seen as we've been deploying these fabrics and some of the, the technologies that are evolving in the industry to help make it easier. You know, some of them are things that we're kind of championing or leading. Some of them are things that are, you know, we're doing as well as others in the industry. So you'll start being exposed to it. Um, but the, the, the fundamental question to ask yourself, if you're, if you're a sysadmin and your responsibility is to get that Hadoop cluster up tomorrow, you want to know, how do I deploy 100 switches in five minutes? Because I don't have time. I've got to get Hadoop up and running. I don't want to worry about my network. I just want it there, done, monitor it, right? So that's really what we're going to be covering today, is what does it take to pull that off? Um, small, two pieces of overview we're going to go through. One of them is, what do I mean by a high capacity IP fabric? And the second one is a little bit of, about Cumulus and Cumulus Linux, so you understand where I'm coming from. But then we'll kind of get down into the, the technical details. Was that? Oh, I'm sorry, if I could just make a snide comment of what I was saying that, that I, I made that my project is the Minnet uh, network emulator, which is already the network virtualization system. And I'd say, well, use Minnet and you just say Minnet with a 100 switch network and it starts up. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're pretty much right on point. I mean, we'll, actually, it's a good point. We're going to get to that. You know, down the stretch, actually. So thanks for, for bringing that up. No, don't be sorry. It's it's, it's completely it's, it's completely on point. Um, the you know the, the type of fabrics that people are building for things like you know Hadoop clusters, you know large data warehousing, three tier applications, uh, kind of a modern cloud oriented data center. Um, you know a, even the app oriented data centers like a Google or an Amazon um, are starting to build out or have been building out for a long time. What we call leaf spine or, or you know fat tree type networks. And, I'm presuming most of you guys know all how that works. So this is the picture. If you want more details, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Um, Lee Spine always baffles me, even though I used to work at Aristo, which talks about Lee Spine all the time. Can you explain like, what that actually means? Just because like, I find it quite a Yeah, I, I think the terms kind of suck. I think it's kind of stupid. I mean, it's like a folded class network, really. If you look at it, it's, you, know, you take the classic telephone, you know, class telephone network, and you hold it X number of stages to the fabric of you know, full full bisection bandwidth, and you cut it in half and pull it over, and you're done. And that's really what people do it. And for some reason, actually, I think a lot of it's a Ciscoism. Um, in that, you know, Cisco always has these terms for the layers in the data center, so they can talk about all their products that fit into a particular layer in the data center. So I think it got a, the terms leaf spine got invented, so I can say this is a leaf switch or this is a spine switch, um, or these are the things that leaf switches do, and these are the things that spine switches do. 
<clears throat> realistically, what I found is, oops, that's, that's gonna go, am I going the wrong way? I'm going the wrong way. Uh, thank you. Um, realistically, what I found is you're, in a modern data center, there's very little difference between what a leaf and a spline does in terms of base function, and there's very little difference between which physical platform can work in either job. It's completely scale dependent. So we have customers that are building you know, leaf spine architectures where they're using modular systems in the leaf and modular systems in the spine. We have customers that are using you know, pizza box type switches in the leaves and pizza box switches in the spines, and they're building you know, five tier folded cloth networks out of that. Um, it really gets down to what they want to build and why they want to do it. So a little bit of background on Cumulus. I'm going to try and get through this part really super fast. Ah, is it animated? <laughs> yeah, slide it does Pardon? Pardon? The slide that does more hiking. I don't think so. I never rehearsed my slides. I <laughs> just pushed the buttons. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar and have, have, have Nick's been beating into a lot of your heads about the fact that you know, traditional networking gear is pretty much locked up as bad as Fort Knox is. Um, and what we do at Cumulus is we take kind of took, uh, or hey David, uh, we realized that uh, networking silicon starts to look very similar, or it's not silicon, but the hardware looks very similar across the board. Um, and, and in the context of, of similar looking networking hardware, um, you, you recognize that the world's kind of seen that type of transition before, and that's what invented a, a modern server operating system uh, like a Microsoft server or you know Linux, any of the Linux variants. Um, so in the Cumulus context, we build a, a, a Linux distribution specifically targeting networking-oriented uh, hardware. Um, you said you worked at Arista, so it's, it's much like EOS. I mean, EOS has characteristics that Cumulus Linux has, doesn't have, and vice versa, but then we also have a lot of overlap. Um, what we talk about on networking-oriented hardware is, you know, this is a picture of a piece of networking hardware, and, and we have a, a, a customer that has, they, they got 15 vendors, you know, incumbents, ODMs, everybody brought their hardware in, they took the top, they took the tops of the boxes off, they laid them all out, and they recognized, I don't know who's is who's. <laughs> you know, this stuff all looks the same. And so, um, you know, we have a, a few hardware suppliers we're working with now, we're constantly bringing more online. Um, but what you're seeing is that the silicon underneath, like from a Broadcom or a Mellanox or an Intel, falls into the same veins as like an x86 uh, server CPU platform does. The, a lot of the IP is, is embedded in that silicon, and different people can take that silicon, put it on a board, and get it to market using you know, different cost structures, different uh, market geographies, and, and you know, different levels of reliability. The last thing about Cumulus before we get to the, the cool stuff is that... Um, you know, as we look through and talk about this stuff, you know, we literally are Linux. So the, the architecture of the software base is that the kernel maintains the database, just like it does in, in you know on a server platform, um, and we synchronize the kernel database with the switching silicon, and that allows all the user space apps to work you know effect, effectively untouched on top of that. So it's super powerful for us. We know when a customer comes and says, hey, I want to use a different routing protocol, we're stable to turn it on and it runs. They want to use a different configuration management engine, a monitoring engine, any of these things they want to use, they can deploy it immediately on top of this platform. Um, in that context, you know, we spend a lot of time with the Linux kernel community making sure that the kernel advances in a way that's interesting for the, the broader networking market, not just for a server you know, specific platform. So now on to installing uh, or deploying you know, high, high capacity fabrics, you know, your 100 switches in five minutes. So the first thing that you come up with, wait, something happened. I think I deleted the slide by accident. Oh well, sorry. Um, let's start from here. I'm going to go back here. So what happens at some point in time is these switches show up in a, in a cardboard box. And you take them out and you put them into a rack at some point, And you have to do something with them. And at that point, um, the very first thing you need to do is make sure that they have the right image on them. And in the context of uh, open networking uh, you know, environment or ecosystem, we've been working with a bunch of the, uh, we'll call them independent software companies in the market, a PK8, a Big Switch, you know, a Facebook OCP, um, to develop uh, an install environment that ships out of the factory on networking hardware. 
And what it does is it takes that management system that lives on there and it gives it an environment to wake up and go and find the networking OS that it wants to install. It's completely networking OS agnostic. It can install Cumulus Linux, it can install the OS if, if Arista wanted to do that. Um, all it does is acts as that install environment. It's the more equivalent of iPixie in the server platform. If, if this picture is kind of confusing. This is, you know, server has apps and operating systems at a BIOS and Oni lives here as, a, as kind of an install mechanism. What, what makes it slightly interesting is that it's, it uses all of the modern awesomeness that we've, we've learned from deploying servers at scale. So it doesn't use TFTP in general, it doesn't use any of those mechanisms, it uses it, uh, uh, HTTP, it can be credentialed, you know, there's interesting waterfalls, it can get, you can run pre and post install scripts, all the types of things you expect from a modern installer. So you have to put the install so you can differentiate in Cisco? <laughs> Yes, the Cisco is buttoned up tighter than anything else to go to the Ventra. <laughs> the, uh, um, you know, if you look at it from a customer's perspective, uh, or actually the ecosystem's perspective, you know, a piece of hardware, like we said, will come out, come in the, in the cardboard, you open the box, and you, you put it in a rack. Um, somehow or another, it got shipped to you. So that means someone had to manufacture that piece of hardware, and they had to, someone had to stock it, distribute it, and some reseller had to resell it. And if you look at the, the ecosystem or the economies of scale of, of hardware, um, and it, it really is, you know, look, starting out with the server you know, environment, focusing there, you recognize it's really easy for someone to manufacture something and get it into a d distributor when a lot of different people can use it for a lot of different purposes. And so um, having that install environment is super powerful. So our hardware partners, you know, obviously support us, but they also support Big Switch, they're also supporting Pika 8. Um, it's, it's kind of opening up that ecosystem around the, the, the hardware supply chain, and then allows the customer to, to do what you'd expect. You unrack the switch, you plug in something in the management port, power on the system, and then it goes off, and that install environment will discover the network operating system. You know, I put Cumulus Linux, but it could be anything else. Goes through, installs that, that that network operating system, and then starts the provisioning steps. How do you bootstrap the management network? Because you, know, what, you, know, you don't have one, right? you, you have 100 switches out of the box, you don't have a management network. Yeah, you know, it, it's an interesting premise. Our experience right now is that most people really still keep that management network. And the management network, obviously, they come in and they kind of build that up as they go separately. That's generally how it gets done. The recursion has to end somewhere. Right? Yeah, exactly. The classic tidal wave problem, right? Um, the did I miss a slide? No, I didn't. Okay. After we go through that um, that network install environment, um, what we start then we typically do is have a post install script that will install something interesting like Puppet or Chef, and then. From there, we'll use that to automate what it takes to bring that system into the network. So it'll you know, set up credentialing, monitoring, configuration management, all of those pieces. I think, let me just double check here. I think I have, yeah, there we go. <coughs> Some examples of what this ends up looking like. This is a, one of the simple configurations. This is like a, a DHCP file, but you'll, it, I don't know how many of you have ever set up DHCP, but um, inevitably you just go through and set a couple of options in the DHCP configuration file, and those get picked up by that installer when they when it comes up, and it knows after it does the 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 in whatever its base operations are to go off into the next step and find the provisioning level where. It would typically do something pretty straightforward like install Puppet from whatever the that backend repository is, set up some host information, and then restart the Puppet agent and let the Puppet agent take off from there. And then the Puppet agent will 
take care of things like adding and deleting users, setting up you know, authentication and audit privileges, license management, all of those back-end processes that are necessary to get the, the equipment into a network and running. Do you guys, have you guys had much experience with any of these configuration management tools? Pardon? Pixie Boot, Kickstart. Kickstart, Pixie Boot, Puppet Chef, CF Engine. Yeah. So are you guys using those, are you provisioning servers with those? Yeah, for the moment we're, we're kind of using that to, for instance, provision a whole cluster right. of, of hypervisors and so on and installing uh, additional software packages for people to cluster management. And so, so do you ever do tests on like just powering on the cluster to see how long it takes to provision a set of hypervisors? Um, most of, uh, actually, it doesn't take too long. Most of the time is in, in for instance, for formatting a file system. Right, yeah. Uh, and, and that's usually well. where most of the time goes. Right. Um, other than that, it's a pretty light install that you need. Right. Uh, just for the basics. And that happens within like 15 minutes. Right. And that's that's what we're seeing. I mean, we're, right now we're talking about the part of, of, you know, getting a piece of hardware, you know, kind of basically set up. and. Um, all of the larger customers that we're dealing with, even the, even the middle-sized customers, are automating that process right now, and they get to the point where they can go into a, a new pod, whatever it is, a, a certain scale, um, turn these things on, and bring the network up, um, you know, within a half hour at most, which is, is pretty impressive because it hasn't always been like that. Let's move this out of the way. Uh, yay. <coughs> <laughs> There's another piece, you know, is if you know the, the classic configuration management paradigm is in the context of a server, what you typically get to is every server is the same. So you just basically give them all the same files. If it's an Apache server, they all just hopefully get the same Apache configuration files. It's reasonably rudimentary. Um, oftentimes in the past, networking devices have been uh, unique. I mean, the, the classic, you know, I'll pick on Cisco since, you know, since I don't think anybody big for Cisco's here. Um, the, uh, you know, the classic model, and you know, some of you may actually have lived this year, is people will generate these massive Perl tarball, or hairballs that generate config files for uh, fabric of switches. Um, and they do that to set up bridging, and they do it to set up routing. Um, and those configuration hairballs come from a couple different dimensions. One of them is that uh, routing protocols are, and routing protocol configuration is a pretty interesting uh, dichotomy. It, on one side, routing protocols are great because you know they're they're really great at discovering things and finding out when things are broken and re reconfiguring themselves around that. Um, unfortunately. Um, on the configuration of routers, we as humans have, have added a little nuance to, to that. And uh, we also use routing to protocols to check topology for us. So we do really kind of dumb things where we'll have a, a you know, high port count router and we'll say, you know, this link has this you know, small subnet and I'm supposed to connect to the other person on the small end of that subnet and then I'm going to run something really nice like OSPF that can discover and, and bring something in really simply but I'm gonna do it over that little subnet. And, and because I have this subnet, it protects me to make sure that the person on the other end knows that that subnet is supposed to be on whatever link I'm connected on. And that way I've proved that the two of us are in sync with each other on our configuration. Um, and, and that's just a nightmare, especially when you start deploying fabrics at scale and you wanna get stuff up and running in, in a very small amount of time. Uh, for two reasons. One is you have to get all that configuration correct and it's phenomenally complex. And the second problem is it's the, when there's something wrong, it's typically not very obviously reported back. So if you, I don't know, I don't know how many of you guys are, are router heads, but if you look at any of the interesting routing protocols, especially kind of from the data center perspective, the ISIF, sorry, the, the OSPFs and the uh, BGPs, there are ways to, config, to make these things run so they're effectively plug and play. So a, a great example would be OSPF with unnumbered interfaces. Um, you can take OSPF routers and configure them with unnumbered interfaces and on point-to-point -point links, plug them all together, they discover each other, and they come up instantaneously. It's really sweet, just like a bridge, but you get a nice IP fabric. Um, so really awesome, except for one tiny little problem, which is what if I wasn't supposed to be connected to David? That's not good. How do I make that work? How do I, how do I deal with that situation? Because I had a benefit of the old complex way. 
and that I could test to, get, to see that I got what I expected out of my network. So what we did, yeah. The, the decade or so old work, <coughs> excuse me, at IETF to extract the adjacency, asserting adjacency and, and maintaining it over time from the routing protocol so that you don't have to do it within ISIS and OSPF and yada yada. Yeah. Has that never gone anywhere or? Remember that there was yeah, that? nothing with nothing with much force. I mean, it's yeah, it never went really anywhere. <laughs> um, the you know when you stand back away from it and look, inevitably what the, the what the customers looking at is they they have a topology graph. They knew I'm, this is what my topology is supposed to look like. This is my wiring diagram. How do I make sure that my wiring diagram is correct? And once my wiring diagram is correct, I'm willing to let everything go off and run. <laughs> And what you'll find is, you know, every major data center that, that I know of, and that's, you know, there's a lot of them, um, has some piece of homegrown technology, um, or you know, partially homegrown technology, where they've gone through and they statically check the wiring map as part of the provisioning steps of their networks. So, an example, there's one concrete example. Of, I can't give you their name, but they go through, they wire up all the switches. And they, they go through on every switch and they check all the LLDP neighbors to see if everything's what they expect it to be. And if the LLDP neighbors are correct, then they'll go through and download configurations onto those devices and start enabling them. And if the LLDP neighbors aren't correct, then they raise an alert and someone goes and figures out what got wired incorrectly. Well, fun, there's a couple fundamental problems with that. A is that whole, there's a, they run like a 26-state 26, 26 state machine across hundreds of switches at a time. Um, which you can imagine is rather error prone at, at best. Um, and th the second part is that that's at build time when they're building out a pod. All of a sudden, someone comes along and changes a link somewhere here or there, and that whole mechanism is now thwarted. It doesn't exist. Now, you know, others run it, you know, periodically, they'll check it every five minutes or whatever, but, you know, it's, it's still typically homegrown technology. Um, we recognized both of those cases, A, that networking, uh, that routing protocols can be super easy to configure, and B, that most people want to check against a, a cabling plan or a well-known topology map. And we put together a piece of technology, it's called the Prescriptive Topology Manager or module. Um, it's actually out on GitHub, so it's, a, it's an open source project, as is that, that network install environment we talked about. So if, if it's interesting to you, you can use it. If, you can use it anywhere, it's not just on any of our equipment. And if you're also interested, you can contribute to it. Um, and it, it does a really simple thing. You build a, a topology graph. You know, if, if you have this topology, you like switch one is supposed to be connected. Uh, switch one port one is supposed to be connected to whatever M stands for, M1 port three. So you draw that topology graph. You do it in the syntax we chose was the dot format. Are you guys familiar at all with dot format? Some are nodding their head yes, some are not. It's a really cool format in that it's, it's a graph-oriented format and there's tons of visualization and editing tools you can use to, uh, to make your job a lot easier. It folds into almost all of the network uh, gra graphing tools, Microsoft Visio. It's kind of, it's very ubiquitous. Anyways, you take this, this dot file and you put it on every device in your topology. So every one of these networking devices would get the same dot file, which is really cool. And then every time a link changes state from down to up, what we do is we go off and we check its neighbor and say, hey, if I'm T2, let's see, it's T2, T2 is not here. If I'm in one, M1 and port three all of a sudden transitions to link up, I'm gonna go off and check my graph and say, hey, who's supposed to be on the other end of that? And if it's S1, I'm gonna take a certain set of actions, which is kind of the thumbs up action. If it's not S1, I'm going to take another set of actions, like, you know, call David and say, David, come out here and fix this thing for me, right? Um, and that, in the end, is what people are looking for in testing out their topologies. So it's a, if, I presume most of you are familiar with IF up down, it's the moral equivalent of a dynamic IF up down based on link transitions. Got a little demonstration, slightly hokey, but it's still useful. Okay, so let's go back to this here. I think I can maybe a slide for this. Yeah. 
So the, in the demonstration, I have uh, four switches connected in a basic folded cloth topology. Uh, spine zero, spine one, leaf zero, and leaf one. And this is the topology file as expressed. So it, you have the device and its interface and what other device and interface it's connected to. So in our demo, we see that same topology file. And then we have a set of actions So we have one set of actions, which is, you know, if you fail, you're going you to write out a failure message. And if it's the correct topology, then you write out a passing action. So let's see here. What do I have? Oh, that's one. <coughs> So in theory, over here, if I did everything correctly, we're looking, we're tailing the, uh, the log file for this stuff, and we will see, we should have seen already. Oh, there it is, right there. We've got the log message that, slide over here. We've got the log message over here that um, this device is not connected to the right Switch. It looks like I messed up the host name of my switch, but it re reports out that this was, this is, you know, the connection was not correct. It expected to be connected to a particular interface on a, on a particular host, and it got a, a different host interface combination than it expected. Why that happened, I don't know, but it did. Um, oops. So let's come down here and do, we're going to set another one up. We wait with faded breath. We should get another log message here. There we go. And this one's also errored. This one was supposed to be wrong. I don't know. I, I must have messed up something in the host configurations. Like I was telling Yanis, I put this demo together and the, about starting at about 11. So sorry. <laughs> but you know, it's kind of it's kind of a, a leading indicator is how easy this kind of stuff is when you know the CEO can put something together like this in a half hour. Um, you know, a, a, somebody that actually knows what they're doing can get it done much easier and, and uh, a lot more robustly. Anyways, here, I you correctly. You, uh, you like brought some links up, and it ran this this if up script, and it actually before it actually brought the link up, it validated or you know enabled connectivity, and then like it somehow validated that it validated that connectivity was correct cited an error and therefore that link is not actually brought up. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, it, it's brought up for from the kernel's perspective, but it's not put into a topology. Like typically those those scripts that I showed you um, and the customers that deployed, yeah. they'll do things like add into a routed topology or put it into a yeah, bridge so or something so else there's, like that. So there's carrier on the link and maybe there's some kind of packets like LDB going over it, but it's exactly. not in the routing and it's not it's not routed and it's not bridged. Exactly. Right. right. Which is means it solves your problem of Oh, I don't want X to talk to Y, but I don't know. I also want to be able to discover the connectivity to make sure that it's right. Exactly. And you can imagine, I mean, this was a super simple description of, of what you do on the pass and fail, but you, you hit the fit right on point. In the more complex cases, you you know enable routing protocols on that interface. If it's correct or if it's wrong, you'll go off and manage your alerting system, which might be something in syslog, or oftentimes people will put together a totally separate collection tree for you know, bad events, and then they set up a notification around that directly. When you set it up initially, does it have a separate control plane? No. It just uses this, it's a standard provisioning text file. So it's not a central control plane, it's all distributed, like you'd expect out of a, you know, a routing protocol type oriented system. So, where are we at here? Uh, yeah, I guess we got, I mean, there's some stuff I could talk to. I, I was hoping to put some things in the demonstration around uh, monitoring and troubleshooting. Uh, 
in general, the, the, the last big trend that we're seeing, and I'd imagine you guys probably leverage this pretty regularly, is uh, you know, there's the, the tool that people have used for quite some time and still use pretty extensively is SNMP for doing networking monitoring. Um, and it's problematic in a couple of different dimensions. One of them is that it, its poll times are exceptionally slow. Um, the other part is that it's, uh, it's got a really high overhead across the system. The, the, the protocol itself is high overhead. All of the agents, the servers, and the, and the clients are very high overhead. And the, what people are doing, or our customers are trying to do, and I, I think a lot of the, you know, some of the other customers of, of other kind of more modern networking vendors, are moving towards push-based pro protocols like CollectB to take statistics and monitoring information off of networking devices and push them back to standard collectors that are centralized. Uh, one of the big advantages that gives you is, and actually there's a ton of advantages you get out of that, but, but one of the ones that's kind of uh, seemingly innocuous, but it, it, it actually pretty cool, is you can separate things like environmentals from things like performance, or things like, uh, you can call them physical things. You know, is this box too hot? Are the power supplies broken? Did a link go down? Does, you know, is my, is, do I have a congestion event? Am I dropping a lot of frames on an interface? Those all go to different people. The same person doesn't manage each of those problems in, in a large data center. So what you're able to do is set up a collect the instance for each of those separate pieces, push it out to the monitoring system that's tuned for that particular you know, user or you know, we'll call them troubleshooter, and they're able to make progress and move forward. So it, it becomes you know, really powerful and, and you can kind of use your monitoring framework to help drive your organizational efficiency. So. That's all I have. Any questions? Do you have a question? In that graph file, the doc format, do yeah. you take uh, regular expressions like uh, leaf should connect to spine? I don't care which port of the spine it goes to, but or which ports, but this is my rough rules for my topology. You can express things like that. But do you see value in that? Maybe I should say that. So I don't, that, when we've talked about it a lot, I don't know if. It's in, implemented right now, but that has definitely been discussed. So you want to be able to wildcard different pieces of it, not just wildcard, but re real regular expressions in there. And there's no fundamental reason to not do that. And again, it's a, a, a Linux system, so you, you bring it up. And it's implemented in Python, so you're, you know, it's not like, you know, it's not like you have to trudge through it in C or something like that. Jared, how, how are you thinking about maybe uh, pushing open source and what becomes commercial or proprietary? So um, most of what we do is open source. So you know, we talked about this open network installer. Like I said, that's an open source project. There's, I think I went through really fast. But there's a GitHub repository for that. You can get to um, the uh, this prescribed topology manager is also open source. Um, we do a ton of work with you know Bird, Quagga, the the kernel, the you know multi, the spanning tree demons. We're doing work with all these people. Um, and our fundamental theory is that you push all that stuff up the screen. I have two questions actually. So the first question is, do you see that being deployed in a data center environment or, or uh, in a telco environment or both? And what are the implications with respect to uh, network security? So on your network security question, that's always a, you know, I can, I can end up in a yeah. rattle there. Yeah. So when you say implications with network security, what do you mean? I mean, is, are there any vulnerabilities that people can exploit when you go to a, a, an open source type of thing? Or, or yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting argument. I, I, I don't know, because I, I can credibly argue, and I've heard people credibly argue it either way. You know, the, the advantage is, you know, if you exploit it, the fact that it will get fixed, you know, if you watch Linux, right, there's security updates you know, occurring in the kernel constantly. Um, but that's because they've been exploited, someone found it, they fixed it, and it's done. Um, so you're kind of getting past all of that. Um, you know, the, the, the interesting thing, you know, the, the counter argument is there's, there's a, a really large networking company that lives down the street um, that you know is super secretive about all of their security exploits, um, and you know some customer, you know, it'll happen. Some customers get it fixed immediately because they found it, but there's other customers that are just kind of trudging along with all these exploits lying around, and they, they don't have visibility or transparency as to what to expect. Mm -hmm. And my first question was about whether these can be deployed in a in a kind of environment. Or? They they can be. Um, you know we're. 
you know, obviously, if you, I mean, telco is always a tough one. We're working with some telcos on deploying this for, you know, kind of data center type needs where, you know, CDN infrastructure, some of them want to kind of do some cloud or over the top services. So they're, you know, working with them in that context. Some of them are interested in trying to figure out how to use it for, like, their main, you know, switching fabric. I'd say that that's a ways off. I mean, there's no fundamental reason why not over time, but it's not quite ready yet. You know, we're doing work on NPLS and kind of bringing that up to snuff as well. And I think once once we get there, it'll start to get more interesting. I, I like your automation and configuration, but usually when you deploy these things, there's some interesting screw-ups. Have you had any interesting experience of things going wrong? You know, trying to, I mean, inevitably when you do deployments, things go weird. Like, you know, you get this ticket that says, hey, you know, I can't ping from this host to this host, what the hell's going on? Um, realistically, so far, most of those are things you know, where we've gone through and found that they've misconfigured their hosts. You know, dumb things like, uh, if you guys are familiar with deploying servers, they inevitably have some sort of an IPMI interface on them. Those get IP addresses. Um, and those, much like, you know, even though the server itself might be a Linux platform that you know how to automate around, the IPMI platform, like a Dell DRAC, is it's kind of Linuxy, but it's kind of like embedded OSE, and so it doesn't follow a lot of these paradigms. And so it's really easy to mess up and misconfigure those things. Um, haven't really had anybody. Yeah, I mean, there's you know, inevitably you have the opportunity for human error. Haven't seen any human error go super haywire. <coughs> what signs the names to the switch? No. Oh, it, it part, you know, it's part of the provisioning process is when it gets its name. So ONI or ONIE is doing this? Well, the o ONI itself is, a, is a, an install environment. So it'll go through and, you know, like I said, it can install the Cumulus Linux, it can install the OS. It'll go through and do that install process, and then it, as, it, as part of that, it also allows for a uh, a post install script oh, to so run. Part of the post so that post install will do things. It, it can be as simple as you know statically assign an IP address or a host name, or run sh you know install. I think I showed it earlier. Maybe you missed it. You know install Puppet and let Puppet come in and do all of those things for you. Just to follow up on that, I mean, it's kind of an interesting problem that you that you posed here, which is that I have this, a bunch of switches. Uh, presumably, I wire them all up correctly. And then, you know, when they boot, it seems to me that each switch has to determine which switch it is and where it actually sits in the topology. Uh, you know, it's got the topology spec, but it doesn't know which switch it is. And so you must have some, it doesn't know which switch it is. Like, am I a leaf switch? Am I a spine switch? Where, what level am I? Yeah, you give, you give, you it, it must be part of that provisioning step. But uh, I'm not, could you clarify what you mean by that? Because they all, you know, boot off a single image. And when they, when they come up, they don't know what they are, where they are, or who they're connected to, right? Or what they should call themselves. Right. I mean, that's, therein lies the, the one place where you have to actually know what you're doing. So, you know, the, what we've typically seen is people will, will have some mechanism that will either, um, yeah, I, I'm going to get kind of deeper. We have an extension to DHCP, for instance, that you can, you can plug a DHCP, uh, a, a, you can run DHCP on a switch and plug it into another, you know, plug a port into that and you'll always get the same IP address and host name out of that. So you can actually, you talked about waterfalling, if you really want to go into depth on waterfalling, you can build your management network out, out of all these things and it all actually tidal waves straight forward um, and you, it bootstraps itself at exactly the same process going forward from one back end instance and every device downstream is given the name based on what it's plugged into downstream. And so you're able to go through and, and work things out that way. Okay, so you can basically name things depending, depending on what they're plugged into the management network, but that won't tell you where they, where they belong in their topology. And topology Probably Why do you need to know? Well, you need to know for the topology file. No, no, Let's, uh, when it breaks. Well, it's not just when it breaks, it's just to do the test, right? If I, I need to know am I S1 or not, or am I S1 or who am I? The interesting thing is I think what you end up getting is, and this should be, this is kind of a graph matching problem, but I think you end up getting is you get up with the topology graph of what's actually installed. Versus and the dot file, what should be installed, right? And you have to match those together. Yep. And, and that seems like an interesting kind of algorithmic problem, actually, which you have to solve somehow. And, and you, which is certainly eminently solvable as long as you're, as long as you haven't totally messed things up. It should resemble 
and then you should basically say, well, it looks like grep on the graph. And basically, you're like, okay, well, this part of your graph matches. We'll assume that the matching parts are this, and then based on that, then you can say, well, these are all the errors. In it. Right. Which I, I think makes. I mean, in, in, in a normal deployment scenario, normal people have an asset um, accounting. Right. I have some asset put in where. Right. There has to be a count that needed. A serial I number, I right? Right, title, MAC address, or something right. that you can you can easily go from there. Yeah, yeah. that's or a MAC, MAC address in your DHCP setup because you uh, associate a certain configuration file with that MAC address, and when yeah. that's just yeah. that's painful. Like you have to know the MAC address. Yeah, yeah. but, but they have to do some actually account. discover it all automatically if you want. It to actually it can much yeah. more powerful. And when you get into it, like as part of the only cut the bring up, it, it passes a whole bunch of system information back as its in initial requests. Which are things like this is my serial number, this is my manufacturing date, my manufacturer. Any information I can glean from myself, I will pass back. So you know, we have a, a demo where we go through just completely based on serial numbers. Exactly what you said. This serial number is supposed to be this device, and the whole thing you know works forward based but, on but that. But that's terrible, right? It's much better for it to just do it automatically. All different strokes for different folks. Some people want to do it. They they want to scan the MAC address, have it go through a barcode label, and, and do it that way. It is. And, uh, yeah, you know, like it really depends on on who you are and what you want to do. If I'm Facebook, I probably don't want to do that. I probably don't care about the serial numbers. I probably just want to replace the device in the rack if it has a red light on. I can't sp can't speak yeah, for Facebook, but I can speak for a couple others that disagree with you. <laughs> they want to have somebody, and I mean, it, it's just like I said, you know, the big a lot of the big guys do things that you wouldn't expect them to do. And the doing part of it, we don't care, but the accounting part of it, we definitely want to know. Right. Not only really yeah, that, but if you say, okay, you want to match that kind of topology there. But there are two ways I can look at that topology. I can look at it this way, and I can turn it around. So, and both in both cases, you'll get the same result for the topology. So, if I want to know which specific switch that is, I'm going to have to have some kind of a, an ID type. Well, no, you can just pick one. Either one works. So, you just pick one. So, so at a even at an order of magnitude level, have you established that the things that you still need to do right for the management? Network to come up so that you can bootstrap all the rest off of that. The management network bootstraps, you know, bootstrap tidal wave the same, exactly the same way. But you still have to have these keys of, you know, it's either based on this guy's MAC address or IP address or something that, that says I have a, a, a different config file for Peter versus Paul, right? Or, or for the position of, of, of where Peter is versus the position of where Paul is. In the what are, the, pre what are the, the precursors that you need in order for the whole machinery that you talked about for the production network to come up with, with kind of zero touch, uh, or nearly zero touch? Right. And it'd be interesting to see, okay, so that work that you had, that somebody had to do, mm -hmm. without which you can't even bootstrap, and get some idea of whether that's a small fraction of the whole old way of doing it uh, right. versus uh, it's half, no matter what it's half. Or ten. Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. We don't have that. I haven't studied that. It's an interesting question to ask. I mean, what we know anecdotally is that it's substantially less than half. I mean, it's, it's, not like it's getting done by your customers unbeknownst to you. It's yeah, nice. exactly. Okay. Right. So you don't, and some, some of our customers are pretty secretive as well. But we know from, just from headcount and you know, operational headcount that, that they used to deploy these things, how much better it is. So, uh, how about Quagra and uh, Bird? You said people can install it. So are they now matured enough and people are using them in a very scalable production environment? Yeah. And these are open source, the one that you can download from the, or yeah. these are then people customize it? Yeah. People use both from Quagga and Bird pretty extensively in different environments. <coughs> okay. Um, you talk about scalability of, you know, the high capacity. How does this compare to people doing an SDN centralized controller? I don't want to put limits on yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to pick that fight. <laughs> Sorry. It's a different, different person than the day. <laughs> uh, regarding your tidal wave, I mean, is there, do you see this changing how people would structure their network? Or do you really think it's feasible to have a production network where there's some guy with a cart just plugs in a switch and it self-validates and something's part of the network. Yeah, so, I mean, we're seeing that in production. I mean, I'm sure, I mean if you talk to Arista people, I'm sure they're seeing it in certain places. Well, I mean, not, we're not the people, we didn't invent zero touch provisioning, right? I know we're right. working on it really hard as well. This is, I mean, this is something in case for Stanford. When a switch fails somewhere on the network, instead of having one of the networking people coming in and replace it, we basically just talk to uh, 
uh, the 24/7 people and say, well, even though they're not that expert, uh, experienced within uh, in networking, and say, okay, so go and pick this piece of hardware off the rack, plug it into there, <coughs> change this IP address or this MAC address, and just boot it, and all the all the rest gets self booted right. And what we're seeing is that, is, is that one last step, you don't even configure anything. They, they, yeah. they, they send someone in, they, they swap it out, put everything in back the way it used to be, and it all comes up. And if it's not right, they, all the alerts go to the right people to go figure out what that person plugged in wrong. Yanis, you had a question? Yeah, so when you want to upgrade the device, you have to go through only again and just go through the whole process? Or Sorry, say again? When you want to upgrade the firmware on a device, you have to go um, to start through only and... No, no, no. no. It's, I mean, there's, well, you can. So some people <coughs> some people like that premise of going through and saying, I want to kind of reinstall everything completely from scratch. But, you know, this is, it's a Linux platform, so there's a lot of different ways. You can do package upgrades, so like app get works on these things. You can do, you know, there, we also <coughs> kind of maintain that premise that most networking devices have having kind of golden image slots. So you can put a new golden image in a golden image slot and then reboot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that we've kind of tried to keep it as flexible as possible. And, you know, all the technologies we've talked about right here, you know, they're not specific to our OS. They're leverageable and usable by any OS. So your original question was, uh, how can I build a 100 switch network in five minutes? And my take is that you know maybe you've solved the, the easy problem, but I wonder if you have an, uh, what I consider the hard problem is actually plugging the things in, you know, getting them all power, and <laughs> actually plugging in all the all the cables. Now I've seen some really neat things, like at ONS they had an open flow controlled robot which went down, <laughs> and went down, went down racks and actually plugged in uh, plugged in optical cables and used knot theory to make sure they didn't all tangle themselves and could do like a thousand connections a minute. So my question is, that's pretty cool. Can, can you, uh, you know, have you tried to adopt, address the problem of actually wiring stuff, which seems to be really hard and can take many hours? And it's also very uh, durable. No, we haven't. And the reason, like, the reason why we haven't is, let's go all the way back to here. Um, like, when when we look at, at a reasonable modern distribution, one of the reasons why we chose the the, the kind of model of our business. People want to buy that thing, and when you're buying at scale, they want to buy that whole thing pre-wired, pre-set up from a supplier, whether it's Dell or Quanta or Acton or Supermicro or whatever. But those guys still have to be plugged in somehow to each other, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. And that's probably, is that still human? Error? Yeah, someone goes through and plugs this thing in, and then this thing gets delivered. Yeah. You know, Cynics Hive, they you know, do all stuff for OCP and Facebook. You know, they do actually do it for a ton of people, Penguin. I mean, there's, you, you just go through the list, and that's, how people are buying hardware these days at scale. And presumably, I guess there aren't that many connections to plug in and get a new rack, but you have to do that right. Well, you know, at, at this level yeah. here, like this is kind of the top of the rack switch that like, literally lives in here. At this level, someone had to wire that stuff through, you know, a conduit or, you know, a cable tray or something. It's not like it's some loose cable lying around. So the number of errors start to fall off as you go. So have time for one last question. All right, go. So you, you spoke about 100 switches in five minutes. How do you keep it going past that for operations? Can you speak about diagnostic tools past that five minutes? Um, you know, I'd say, right, probably best here. Yeah. So, you know, I talked about monitoring the, the, the and it's, it's kind of too long to continue, not enough time to go into this. The, the modern architecture for monitoring people are moving to is kind of, I call it parallel frames. So um, I want to create a frame to monitor something like, you know, physical things, power supply status, environmental. I want to create another one for things like link or maybe optical transceiver power. And so what you end up doing is people are able to, you know, in, in, on modern networking equipment, put together a, a management framework that makes sense for any one discipline to troubleshoot that set of problems. And, they, and people are pushing that stuff back into collectors. Um, one of the advantages, again, of, of that, that modern system is that a lot of those same collector bases or, or backends are getting information from applications as well as the hypervisors or OSs. And the customers are able to cross-correlate events. So inevitably, it's, it's this kind of the simple way of looking at it. App works fine at 1 p.m. App is broken at 4 p.m. What the hell happened between 1 and 4 p.m.? Right? And if you look at the historical way, the way that worked was, you know, App at 4 p.m. has got messed up connectivity things. I'm going to call some networking engineer. Hey, networking engineer, my app's messed up. The networking engineer starts from scratch, tries to figure out what the heck went on. 
but by folding back into the, the same framework everybody else is going into, it, you can actually go back and recreate timelines. And so people, you know, there's a lot of, I just say, I'll just read one number of people I know, that, you know, the MSDCs are doing homegrown things. There's some people working on, you know, startups and commercial offerings around going through and pruning connectivity graphs. Like if the app was talking to these other endpoints, what other things along that way might have, you know, been affected across that time frame. So now I can call what I'm going to pay attention to and find the one thing that caused my app to be messed up. So just as important as the, as the NACs or the apps too. To actually yeah. understand the behavior. So the question is, as you go forward with this, is there some standard diagnostic orchestration framework that every one of these can actually plug into? Right? I'm not seeing any of that right now. What I'm still seeing, what I'm seeing is, you know, the classic Hadoop data structure, and everybody's going to go back and look at it. And the reason why is, it's kind of like herding cats. You know, every app developer wants to push back some information, whatever they want to push back. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to know about your framework. I'm going to push back this stuff, and you know, the network person's going to do this. The hypervisor's pushing back information. Trying to get all those people to standardize on some format is kind of a net never proposition. Um, so I, I think realistically, or what I'm seeing, you know, maybe the venture can speak to it some, is uh, people just realizing how to normalize normalize the content as it comes in, or if you're going to go back through and prune, you go through and search on the things that are meaningful to you and create plugins for you know, what your different endpoints are. Okay, thank you very much.